Trucker. I love Brother Trucker. Yeah. Tony, do you know Brother Trucker? Curse. That's uh, Andy Fleming's tune, uh, Downtown. They're they're excellent. Yeah, they are excellent. And it's it's kind of a sad story. It's about uh, a a homeless youth who ends up that way because his parents do not accept him when he comes out as a gay man. So. Uh, Andy writes some pretty powerful tunes, and that's certainly one of them. Hey, I want to take a second to thank the Iowa chapter of the Sierra Club, also Iowa Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the Great Climate March, the Great March for Climate Action, for sponsoring the Fallon Forum. I also want to thank Gateway Market for sponsoring this segment of our show. And I want to thank some of our other business supporters, uh, Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling. You might know Leonard Tinker, Tony. Well, it's an interesting connection with Leonard Tinker in his case because my father-in-law at the time was on the Des Moines School Board. Really? Yes. Okay. So uh, your dad probably voted a... My father-in-law, my wife's father. Your father-in-law. Okay, go. that's fascinating. I want to hear more about that. Dr. Caudill. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, Tinker is a sponsor of this program. His business, Heating and Cooling, does some great work on air conditioning units and furnaces. Also, uh, Hawk Restaurant, where I plan to have lunch, that's down in the East Village. It's uh, East 5th and Walnut, and they get 90% of their food at Hawk Restaurant from local sources. And a quick tip of the cap to the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit coming up in November. The IES, as we know it locally, is a great opportunity for folks who want to start their own business. Uh, or learn how to expand their business, or learn how to deal with, for example, the Affordable Care Act and all the changes that affect businesses because of that, and all the uh, changes in tax code as well. Uh, Later in the program, Andrew Rasmussen with the Des Moines Education Association joining me to analyze the education reform proposal that passed the Iowa House, Senate, and the governor's approval this session. We'll talk about that, but first, I'm delighted to have Tony Bisignano in the studio with me. Tony and I served in the legislature. I, he was smarter than me. He got out before I did, but now he's not so smart anymore. He wants to get back in. Well, uh, you know, Ed, I always did think you were smarter. <laughs> really? Well, there you go, sucking up to the talk show host. That's good. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin any, any, any good political feeling we have right now just to kick it off. I, I want to remind you that last week in the Red Sox beat the Yankees 2-3 to three in Yankee Stadium. Well, you know, you have your cycles, and we're, <laughs> we're still basically filled in a triple-A team. Okay, <laughs> well... <laughs> And 17, what, 17 to 3 victory over the Texas Rangers? Incredible. They're putting up incredible numbers this year in runs. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. And this from last night. Did you see last night's game? No, check I don't. Check this out. I, I don't watch check, check this out, Tony. Check this out. This is the ninth inning tied 3 to 3. David Ortiz steps to the plate. Boom! Look at that. Walk off home run. I got to say, Big Poppy, I think he's a favorite of everybody's. Well, he's pretty cool. There he goes. All right. Not enough of that. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. Anyway, Tony, I just had to subject you to that. I hope that uh, wasn't too painful. You know what? Well, we play enough games through the year. I'm sure we're both going to have our melancholy moments uh, at the end of each, each series. Well, you're wearing that Yankees uh, shirt, that darn, or I should say, I think the word is damn Yankee shirt, so I had to at least show something with a Red Sox flavor. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> disappointed that you don't have your Boston regalia on for today because that, that is our rivalry. Yeah. <laughs> The extent of my 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 uh, my, uh, my my wardrobe is a cap, and I use I've used it for gardening a lot lately, so it's a little bit soiled. <laughs> but we have more important things on our mind, do we not? We absolutely do. How long have you been out of the uh, legislature now? Been out of the legislature fifteen years. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. Wow, that's longer than Branstad was out. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> I I guess I beat him at something. <laughs> you beat him at something. <laughs> well, you might beat him at a lot of things, uh, especially if we start talking about sensible positions on issues but uh again you know it's 15 to 50 that's a long time ago things have changed and i've gotten older yeah you well yeah you've got a little <laughs> older yeah uh what's uh, what's bringing you back why uh, i mean i don't think anybody saw this coming i didn't see this coming i didn't you know you and i banter a lot we haven't talked we talk serious politics once in a while but um i didn't see this coming what uh what inspired you to get back in well, you know, I've always I've always loved uh, politics and loved serving uh, the people, and I served ten years in the legislature. But but politics is opportunity and timing. And my good friend Jack Hatch, uh, who chose to uh, run for governor, uh, was the current sitting senator, and he's up for election, and he will be giving that seat up uh, to pursue uh, the governorship. So uh, those opportunities don't come around very often, and, and I'm prepared in life. I'm at the right stage of life. Uh, to where I think I can go back, take the old style that we used to have, where people got along uh, on both sides of the aisle, worked out compromises, didn't personalize, 
and uh, try it in this new era. It's become yeah. uh, kind of mean and nasty. And so it has changed a lot. It, it, yeah. I don't mm-hmm. even know if I'll recognize the place from, from the days when, when truly there was a bipartisan spirit, not on everything. And as you know, uh, I'm a Democrat. Uh, I have priorities. We have uh, our funding priorities, but all in all, there's a way to sit down and reasonably work out just about uh, any issue to some, to some solution uh, that you can get uh, white support. Yeah. Now, uh, it's, 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 not, um, it's not uncommon when you have a seat that is as Democratic as that Senate seat to have a very crowded and spirited primary. Uh, I mean, you could see as many as six, seven, or eight candidates running on the Democratic side. Well, originally, uh, when I ran my first time in, in 1987, uh, it was a six-way primary. Really? And because the election is decided in the primary pretty much in, in, in those heavily uh, Democratic or Republican districts. And so the battle is the primary. I expect to have uh, challengers. Um, you know, uh, you want challengers because uh, you want to be able to put your position out. And, and being that it's, it's a uh, primary election that's going to decide it, uh, people need to know where everybody stands. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy with the response uh, that I've gotten since I've announced. Yeah. Now, I, I would hope that it would remain a clean and issue-focused primary. Uh, I know better than to say that I would bet money on that. <laughs> I mean, the, these, uh, you know, the, these are high stakes uh, competitions anymore. And well, it's very possible that it could get ugly and mean. And I, 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 I presume that you'll prefer to stick, uh, stick to the issues and focus on what you believe in and what you want to accomplish. Absolutely. I mean, I, in my announcement, um, and, and I think people who have followed politics know Tony Bisignano, uh, knows that back uh, in the day when he served, he was extremely successful in being able to uh, to move legislation and represent people, but at the same time uh, had some miserable personal failures uh, that uh, I decided to step out of the politics, uh, regroup my personal life, my family, and uh, come back. Now, that's been uh, 15 years ago, and I don't think people want to hear uh, these types of things. I don't think anybody uh, is going to base their decision on who's going to represent them the best on what maybe personally I did 15 years ago, because, you know, we're all human beings. Uh, I've apologized. I've admitted it. I've done so in the last few weeks. And I think it's time to just talk about issues. But, yeah. you know, that's that's everybody's personal decision on how they want to campaign. That, that's my take as well. But I have no doubt. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I would not be surprised if some opponent decides to personalize this and to paint you in a negative light because of something that happened in your past. Well, I mean, the, good, the good thing, Ed, is, is I've lived in this district 61 years, and uh, I grew up there. I went to school there. I go to church there. Uh, I coached Little League there. My kids went to Lincoln High School, and it's a predominantly South Des Moines district. And so no one's going to redefine me. People know me, and, and they know today whether they like me, uh, whether they will support me. Now I just want to articulate the current issues so they have a choice on those. But that district has changed quite a bit since you represented it 15 years ago. I mean, part of that was my legislative district uh, when I was in the in the House. And even in the 10 years that I represented it, I, we're not, not quite 10 years, I guess six, I saw it change quite a bit. Um, the old Italian guard you know, dying off, moving away. It's becoming more, uh, I mean, a stronger Latino presence in that neighborhood, in fact. Yes, there is a stronger Latino presence. Um, but I grew up with, with, with a, a large number of Hispanics. And, uh, you know, the, the terminology changes are Latino, Hispanic. Then they were Mexican. Um, they were from Mexico. They immigrated. My father immigrated uh, from Italy. So I'm first generation American. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't distinguish each other by color or by title, nationality. We were just friends, and we all were in the working poor class. Our, our families were just getting established in this country. And I feel, I feel very, very confident that uh, uh, those people still have remained my friends. Now, without, without a doubt, the biggest demographic change in that district is downtown. I mean, it wasn't that many. When you left 15 years ago, we called downtown Dead Des Moines or Dead Moines. De- Des Moines was Dead Moines. And somebody quipped that you couldn't fire a cannonball through downtown Des Moines after five o'clock and hit, and you would only I think hit that a was you, Ed. No, it was not oh, me. Okay. <laughs> only hit a homeless person. I would never say something like that. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was. I mean, I remember walking home from the Capitol, uh, and I would sometimes, sometimes it would be early, from, you know, five, six o'clock, and it would be dead. Look at it now. It's not just a vibrant social, cultural, culinary life, but also you've got a lot of people living downtown. I mean, downtown housing used to be. Mostly low-income uh, buildings, Elliott, Randolph, uh, L.C. Mason, uh, 
uh, whatnot. And, and I, I'm, I, I hope that element can continue because I think we need to provide opportunities for everybody at, at all income levels. But a lot of the housing in downtown Des Moines now is real upscale, real expensive, and young, professional. It's a, it's a huge demographic shift. I mean, is that, is that one? I mean, I assume you've been tracking that and have some plan on how you might uh, connect with that growing, you know, urban core crowd. Well, you're right. It has changed. It's changed dramatically. Uh, but I, I think the, my message, I think my issues and my positions uh, represent uh, across the board. It's opportunity. Uh, it's creating opportunity for people at all levels, you know, uh, just because you're, you're maybe in the upper income uh, doesn't mean that you still have things that, that you wish to see developed in this community. But the bottom line with me and always has been, I think, with you is fairness. You know, it's equal opportunity. And, and I think if we don't lift everyone along and you look at the housing, it's mixed housing because yeah. of the tax credits. You know, uh, some of them are income based and some of them are very wealthy. But I think all in all, we want a good community. We want a good, clean state. We want equal opportunity for, for jobs and for education. And I don't think that comes with the demographic. I think that's just who we are. Yeah. Now, and, and folks, so you, so you know, um, when Tony and I served together, we fought all the time. Um, we were not, we, we didn't get along all the way. Remember those days? I remember those days. Yeah. Uh, you know, you came in and, <laughs> and, and you and I probably agree on most everything, except you take it just a little farther left than I do. And, uh, and it was just a matter of how are we going to get, get something passed. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of times um, you have to be able to concede. And, 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 and when it came to compromise, uh, you were stubborn in that area. But I tended uh, to be stubborn. I respected where you stood on issues. It was just uh, at what point were we going to be able to truly pass something yeah. for, you know, for Iowa. And, and I, I admit to having come, come in with a, a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I was, um, I, I was influenced by the, the strong debate at the time back in 1992 based on the Iowa trust scandal that said, uh, this place is corrupt. Uh, look what's happening up here. Uh, money's, money's corrupting the place and, 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 and influence wielding. And I, I came in thinking, yeah, I'm going to find corruption everywhere I look. And, and so I, I came in with kind of a, I'm going to clean this place up. And, you know, it was, it was a bit cocky and young and, uh, and, uh, and, and again, I will say this, I, I think, um, I think the assessment that the lobby has too much influence, that is certainly true. I certainly saw every, everything I saw bore that out in my mind. And, and but I, I also saw a lot of, you know, over time, legislators who really did care about doing something for their constituents, for our state, for the, the right issues. You know, the beautiful part about the Iowa legislature, especially when you come from somewhere like South Des Moines, yeah. um, you know, you, you're, you're pretty much uh, with the people that you grow up in the, in, in the, the economic style uh, that we had. But you get in the Iowa legislature and you get an opportunity to meet Iowans. You get an opportunity to meet rural Iowans and yeah. older Iowans, younger Iowans. Uh, people are coming from communities of 1,200. I mean, I got that many relatives on the South Side. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, I really... Well, that's enough to win a primary, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, you, you don't know if they'll all vote for you. But, but I appreciated that part. And I think, you know, you, you know, you have a perception of the legislature, and some are true. But all in all, they're very good people, and they come in to do the right thing for the way they perceive uh, issues and that's where you really have to come to the center on some things is the perception everybody comes in thinking they're right yeah and and no one's completely right so that's the art of the compromise and that that's the way I approach politics what bothers me more than anything is when politicians uh, think for some reason they do not have an obligation to respond to constituent inquiries or media inquiries and you know there are people up there right now who do a fantastic job of that more of them tend to be Republican than Democrat. I mean, Rob Hogue is great. Dan Kelly is fantastic. Brad Zahn is really good about responding, you know. Uh, but there are plenty of, I mean, in some of the Democrats locally, they're really bad at it. They, they, don't, they don't take the time to respond. And I, that, that means uh, that bothers me more than anything. I mean, even Tom Vilsack, even as Secretary of Agriculture for the entire country, is very responsive. Far more responsive than a lot of folks at the state capitol, I have found. I mean, Terry Branston, he's terrible. You know, but uh, it really varies. But that's one thing that I really respect is when a politician commits to and follows through on being willing to dialogue with their constituents. Well, and I, I think Ed, a lot of it goes goes to, you know, are you there to represent your party? Or are you there to represent your people? And when you work for just your party, you have talking points right. and you really don't have much to say because someone else, <clears throat> someone else has already said it or everyone's saying it. But when you're an independent thinker, and, and you care about the people you represent. And, and I really love the district that I, I born and raised in. Uh, 
I, I liked it I, from Des Moines, so I could visit with them that evening. They can come to the Capitol that afternoon. I could call them directly and immediately, where other legislators had to wait till the weekend to respond. And so, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's an individual thing, but people have to know that about you and what type of person. Do you just say hello, or are you just out there when you want something and when you're running, or are you generally among people in your district on a regular basis? Yeah, and I want to I want to switch to talking about issues here when we come back from the break, but, but one more question about politics and process. Uh, again, it's, it's a big district. It's, it's a Senate district. There are about 60,000 residents, uh, a lot of ground to cover. Are you, gonna, are you planning on doing a lot of door knocking? Well, you know, I'll do some door knocking. Uh, sometimes that's not as effective. Uh, today is a little bit different. People don't open their door to strangers like they used to. You know, and in the day you can walk through the neighborhood. And, I thought and, you weren't a stranger. And, well, <laughs> you are when you knock on that door. And, uh, you know, direct mail, uh, phone conversations, events. Uh, there's, you do a variety of things to reach, you know, different demographics of people. Well, if you go door knocking, I would highly recommend you get a bike. A bike. A bike. This one here? This, will you this, loan me this, this one here in the studio? I don't know, bike. You want to go campaigning with Tony Bisignano? I don't think I'd mind. You don't mind? I don't mind. She's good. I mean, Very and when, you, when your voice gets tired, I mean, give us an idea. What, what would you say if you landed at the door and you were campaigning for Tony? Um, vote for Tony because I can talk. <laughs> That's all? Are you well, you, you got to coach do, her a little do bit. Do I need she more? Would, you have to say my last name because they wouldn't know who Tony <laughs> no, was. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, a talking bike. I mean, if you, if you can get one of those, uh, definitely take that door to door with you. Okay, when we come back from a break here, folks, I want to talk, uh, talk with Tony about some of the issues that... I think folks are, uh, are talking about here in Central Iowa also get a sense of what issues he wants to prioritize. If you want to call in and join the conversation, it's 244-0077-244-0077. And a reminder, the second half of the show, we're switching gears to talk education with Andrew Rasmussen. I again want to thank Gateway Market for sponsoring this segment of our show and remind you to check them out, folks. They're a neighborhood grocery store at, at uh, 20th and Woodland in the Sherman Hill neighborhood, the district that uh, Tony is running to represent, in fact. Uh, again, not just a grocery store, but a great cafe and a great catering service as well. I also want to thank some of my other business supporters. Tally's Restaurant, Bar, and Catering up in Beaverdale. Had dinner last night with, uh, with three of my co-workers at uh, Tally's. Fantastic meal. And I strongly recommend you check them out for dinner, lunch, or Sunday brunch. And uh, do not forget uh, Diana's Wedding Cakes. Um, Maddie, my producer, has come to her senses and is now ordering a cake from Diana's. So uh, consider that, folks. Uh, she makes fantastic cakes. And I want to uh, remind folks about the Matthew Shepard uh, Scholarship Awards Banquet coming up uh, this uh, evening, Friday evening, at the Convention Center. I'll be back in just a minute. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno, one, of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates, in just a minute. There's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too, but actually it's the beginning of Webcast One Live, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together, and uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I 
can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. Man. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Studio in the Skywalk, broadcasting from the cultural and culinary crossroads of America. That would be Des Moines, Iowa. Again, what used to be Dead Moines is now Des Moines and is a hop-in place with uh, all manner of food and uh, cultural activities. And tonight, a great event happening tonight, the uh, Matthew Shepard Scholarship Awards Dinner. Uh, that's going to be at the uh, Convention Center, 5.30 tonight. I do not know whether it's too late to get tickets, but you might consider looking into it. It's really, it's going to be a well worthwhile uh, attending event. The uh, parents of Matthew Shepard, Ju Judy and Dennis Shepard, will be keynoting the event. And not only will I be there, but Tony Biziana will be there. So if you see me and you see him, I'll introduce you. Or if you know, he know you, if you know, if he, you know them, Tony and I don't, we can go the other way. Uh, yes. All right. I also want to quickly thank the Fighting Burrito at 13th and Locust here in Des Moines and on Welch Ave in Ames. Uh, join the fight, folks, and get a custom-made burrito for real cheap. Uh, also want to thank uh, Kim Holding and uh, Story County Veterinary Clinic. I'm going to see uh, Kim on Sunday up in Madrid. That's where one of her, um, her uh, veterinary clinics has been. The uh, main one now is on 30th Street. Uh, sorry, Highway 30 between uh, Ames and Nevada. And, of course, Ritual Cafe. Part of my daily ritual, maybe make it part of yours as well. Coffee, tea, paninis, uh, great, uh, great, um, what are they called? Smoothies, there we go. And some fantastic music as well. All right, Tony, usually, you know, you've got three issues you run uh, run, uh, run for election on. I mean, I mean, I don't want to assume that, but presuming you've got that, what are, what are your top three reasons for wanting to get back in the uh, state Senate? Well, one, again, is where I began, and, and that's representing people who don't have the voice uh, as the lobbyists do and the, and the corporations uh, do in the Capitol. These people just go to work every day, uh, work hard, struggle, and hope that the people they elect are doing the right thing to try in some way to improve their life. And so uh, it's economic justice, it, 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 whether it's, it's jobs, and not only jobs, but jobs that pay well. Uh, and it's, it's health care. Because healthcare, without it, you're, the vulnerability at any moment can strike like lightning. Um, and, and I think that uh, we need to invest more money in the state's uh, infrastructure, the vertical infrastructure. And, and, and the state, I think, the, I think the sad state of the last session, we're sitting with about $800 million uh, in savings, which means it's, it's overtaxed Iowa. We were, but that's a lot of that's been gobbled up in tax cuts and... Well, I believe we're, we're still going to be sitting with that amount of money, and so. we're still growing at a, at a very good pace. But why we didn't take $100 million in cash, which is sitting there, and put it into the infrastructure, put people to work, put, put the trades to work. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when, when people like that are, are working and there's, there's employment at good wages, it ripples through small business, and everyone benefits. So, and, and so, so infrastructure building, building what specifically? Well, I think repairing. Uh, number one is is we have we have state buildings that that are crumbling. We've been trying to replace the one gold building up at the state. Is that the Wallace building? I don't recall. Yeah. Uh, we we talked about that when I was in there. Yeah. Um, I just think those. I, I know we we do a lot at universities, uh, but I think that we need to offer uh, jobs through through one time costs of construction. When you, <clears throat> when you talk about roads and bridges, you know, you're talking about a different funding stream. Right. But I think that... Um, but it may, it may be hard to get the, the voters excited about the state spending tax money to fix state buildings. I mean, a lot of money's been pumped into the state infrastructure already. Maybe easier to get them excited about doing more improvements to the universities. But, you know, what about, what about uh, more infrastructure funding for our public school systems? Absolutely. You know? At all levels. I, I, think we've, I think we've neglected all of the public facilities because of recessions, uh, because, because the people want to cut taxes. Um, you know, that's great. But, you know, this, this last property tax bill, uh, I didn't find it to be a big benefit to working uh, How would people you vote in, in the that? district. Well, I, I may have voted for it, but I would have had to have some things in it before I would. There would have had to have been some, some safeguards. Um, you, you know, know, those weren't in the final bill. No, they weren't. Not in my opinion, they weren't in the final bill. 
And, uh, you know, when we read, uh, I think, on, on the Internet the other day, Facebook, uh, maybe is where I read it, where, where Walmart, a Walmart center with 300 employees cost the government $1.7 million uh, in government assistance that their employees mm-hmm. qualify for. Well, yeah, Walmart advertises to their employees or to their prospective employees that they should apply for food stamps and other types uh, of absolutely. public Absolutely, and at the same time, we're, we just cut their property tax. Right. Uh, th- that would not have happened with my support. Yeah, not as much as Branstead wanted to, but it was still in the bill. I was surprised the Senate Democrats were willing to settle for any level of that. Well, and, and, and I can disagree. I, I can disagree again because uh, independently I represent people uh, in my district. And uh, when you, for example, you, you change the property tax rate on multifamily dwellings and uh, you, you now tax them at some level as residential, there's nothing in there that talked about rent reduction. Right. You know, the people who live in those facilities that give them back something. Right. And what we got offered is if we have enough money and when we do, uh, we may give you $30 or $60 in, a, in an income tax cut. Uh, we're the only ones that have to wait with conditions of whether we get any tax cut. Uh, corporations are guaranteed now their property tax reduction. Yeah. Well, it's um, now what about the related to both the property tax discussion and economic development? Uh, you have Governor Branstad with some Democrats agreeing and going along with it, giving a hundred and fit. Well, I, actually, if you factor in all the local tax breaks as well, 251 million to one Egyptian fertilizer company. Um, that's economic development in some folks, some people's book. Uh, it's not in mine. Uh, I'm also not a fan of 18 million for Facebook to create what 31 jobs. I mean, where where would you stand on those kinds of economic development questions? Well, I think I think the Facebook uh, deal uh, is going to create a lot of jobs for short term to build, and that's good for that's good for the construction workers and the trades uh, in Central Iowa. Afterward, what it basically is going to be is a very large high tech warehouse. And warehouses with generally with very few employees. With very few employees, yeah. and so are those the right places to put that kind of money? Um, you know, Facebook. They're getting well. They through this property tax cut bill are also included in having their property taxes sure. cut, even though the city which they're they're going to reside is already waived. Uh, I think property taxes for twenty years. Yeah, Altoona. And, yeah. and again, what is you know that's great in the construction, and I and I welcome that. But I also say is what are we doing for the working person day after day? And that's what I will be fighting for at every level: education, jobs, health care, mental health care, uh, environment. Uh, those are the things that that I'll be there every day for. Yeah. Now uh, a different issue: uh, marriage equality. Um, back in nineteen ninety six, I, I I led the uh, fight uh, against. The Defense of Marriage Act, the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. And when I turned around, I realized there was nobody else <laughs> on that battle. Uh, I mean, it was really a lonely fight back in, in the mid-90s. Right now, it's become you know, a, lot more, uh, a lot easier to jump on board. Uh, there's still plenty of work to be done. We still have a lot of work to be done. And we need people at the legislature who are championing equality. You know, where do you stand on that issue? Well, Ed, uh, if it was lonely for you in the 90s, it was lonely <laughs> for me and, and other legislators in 1989 when we fought when we fought for uh, equal rights for, for gay lesbian. And, uh, you know, the district I represent is, is a very conservative social district. Right. And uh, so it wasn't a popular district. It wasn't something that uh, you expected to pick up a lot of support on, but it was the right thing to do. And, and that's where it gets back to what type of person you are. Yeah. Um, of course, I support, uh, you know, the equal rights for everybody, human rights for everybody and uh, without distinction. And so, you know, when you can do it in 89, uh, I know you can do it in 2014. Right. And uh, uh, I will continue just to, to always try to make it fair and equal for everyone. So back to the three bills that uh, that became the kind of the, um, the the landmark legislation of this most recent session, the the uh, the property tax bill. You're really not you're not quite sure how you would have voted on that. You said you would have had to get a little bit more in there. I think I could have had some impact into that bill and, well, and putting some better uh, conditions in there for for the the working people rather than everything moving to the top. What about the Medicaid bill? I, I well I think that uh, I think. I, maybe you did and I did. Who else didn't see that coming? The fact that that was going to be leveraged for property tax. Right. And so at the end, when they actually allowed the governor to leverage that for property tax, um, that was uh, that was crazy to me because uh, where else was he going to go? The plan he had probably would be declared illegal. It wouldn't have been accepted. It was, it was not logical. I mean, why would you choose to spend more money to cover 150,000 less people? 
When, and, you, and the argument was that, well, we can't trust the federal government to keep its promises. Well, that's the and funny you, and, thing. And you also go ahead and, and declare all these uh, states, uh, counties, disaster well, counties. Well, let me comment <laughs> on that because the governor kept saying that over and over. Is he couldn't trust that the federal government would in the future would fund that. Right. The federal government has never reneged on the funding for Medicare or Medicaid. Right. Although the governor has reneged on much funding to local governments right. uh, through point, tax credits. And so, you know, he's looking in the mirror when he's talking about someone's not going to keep their word on, on, on uh, tax cuts that he offered, uh, elderly credits, uh, uh, homestead credits. He's underfunded those consistently. So if there's anybody you've got to watch when they make you a promise, um, yeah. it's the governor. I would agree with that. And I mean, Governor Branstad in the end really did not get his way in a big way on the Medicaid bill, but I think you're right. He used it as leverage for the property tax bill. I, I presume you would have probably voted for the final Medicaid bill. Absolutely. Yes, it, it was the best it was going to be got yeah. uh, this year. And Senator Hatch, of course, was a key player in that, and I have no doubt that he'll be probably, he'll be talking about that issue as he runs for governor. As he should. J yeah. Jack's been a leader uh, in health care uh, and in issues uh, facing underprivileged Iowans. Uh, that's that's Jack consistently since I've known yeah. him 30 years. And so, of course, it ought to be a centerpiece. And you ought to be proud of it. And finally, uh, as we as we segue to the next segment of the show, talking with Andrew Rasmussen about the education reform bill, how would you have voted on that piece of well, legislation? Well, you know, I don't know enough about that, that bill. Um, there's so many components of that, and you know, the homeschooling component. Um, I don't I don't really know without reading that and having some discussion. Education <clears throat> is a very deep and difficult issue. Uh, it covers it, it covers kids from, you know, four or five years old uh, up through higher education. Um, and, and so that I consult with with the experts in education. I don't always agree. But uh, to say how I would do that without even looking at that bill wouldn't be fair and, and wouldn't be honest. All right. That's responsible. Yeah. I mean, I, there's nothing I, I, I've never had a tr had had trouble. I've never gotten negative feedback from a constituent when I was in saying, you know, I haven't studied that enough yet. Well, anybody that has it's, an answer to everything has really no answer to anything. Yeah. Well, at some point you got to, you know, you got to make a decision. But again, th that thing was moving so fast. Uh, well, I, I, maybe it wasn't moving fast, but it was get, it was going through so many convolutions. <laughs> it was hard to really keep track of it. It was. Uh, the there end, was yeah. always a, a different component uh, that was coming at you and causing the problem. And when you're not there and you're not in, in, in you know, in the circle of talking with educators um, uh, and, and parents, I don't want to, I wouldn't comment on it well, now. Tony, as the primary shapes up, I, I mean, I'm going to extend the same offer to other candidates to come on this program, both Democrat and Republican. Uh, and as the primary shapes up, and when we have an identified field, I'd love if we can manage, depending on how many candidates there are, if we can manage it, I'd love to have you and the other candidates uh, back in here for an actual debate. Well, well I'll, I'll take a look at that, Ed. Uh, See, noncommittal. I, I, I'm not going to commit. <laughs> I don't know what the field is. And, I got you. And, Fair but enough. You know what? I'm always willing to come on and discuss with you openly, yeah. honestly, how I feel, what I've done, and what I intend to do. And that's what I intend to do in the campaign. Well, if we can, if we can, uh, if we can find areas of agreement, that's good. I know one thing we'll never agree, agree on is uh, how what a horrible baseball team the Yankees are, and how wonderful and awe-inspiring are the Boston Red Sox. Well, and, and I think I think you're you're right on the, uh, this part of the season. As I said, the AAA team is pretty much playing for the Yankees. And I looked this morning. I think we're a game and a half out, and so. Uh, I think uh, in the end, we're going to be in the playoffs. Do you, do you want to see that clip again with David Ortiz hitting that home run, well, to, that walk-off home run? I didn't see Mark Teixeira's when he came back and he had seven RBIs in two days, one grand slam and one three-run homer. Uh, well, I don't see that clip up there on the wall. No, and you never will. Get that one for me <laughs> next time will. I'm here. <laughs> All right, we'll skip the clips anyway. Uh, Tony Bisignano, folks, uh, back in the uh, ring running for the uh, state senate after uh, 15 years. Uh, not exactly in hibernation. You've been working pretty hard at the uh, county level, but uh, it'll be an interesting campaign. Uh, Jack Hatch is running for governor. That Senate seat is opening up. It's a very Democratic seat. We may see action on the Republican side as well, but I expect a very spirited and interesting primary on the Democratic side. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ed, for inviting me. And maybe we'll see you tonight at the Matthew Shepard Scholarship Awards Dinner. I'll look for you. All right, folks, and don't don't forget about that. This is coming up tonight, uh, 530 at the Convention Center. Again, I want to thank the Matthew Shepard uh, Scholarship uh, Dinner folks for uh, helping to uh, support this program and encourage you to go and be a part of a very important event in a movement that has grown very powerfully in very quick in, in a very quick um, uh, amount of time, uh, we've seen a long, lot of changes toward equality in this state for the gay and lesbian community, and it's very encouraging. Again, I again want to thank the uh, Fighting Burrito for helping to sponsor uh, this show, and also um, also S and P Piano. I don't know whether you have a piano, Tony, but if you did and you wanted to move it, I would highly recommend going to S and P Piano. Thank you. Uh, they've been doing this for a long time, and they will move pianos anywhere in the country. 
Uh, I am another one of my supporters, uh, business supporters, a Sergeant's Garage. Graham Gormley does great work on cars. He's been fixing my cars for a long time. If only I could get him to fix bikes. Again, he's at 6th in college at Sergeant's Garage. Check them out. And also want to thank uh, Dan Kelly, who's a state rep, but in his spare time, he's a real estate agent, and he sells Newton. He does a great job with uh, selling and buying properties in Newton. So if you've got a home you want to look at, a business you want to look at in Newton, give Dan Kelly a shout. I'll be back in just a few minutes. Uh, Andrew Rasmussen is going to join us. He's with the Des Moines Education Association. We're going to continue where Tony and I left off talking about education, specifically the education reform proposal that passed the State House and got signed by the governor recently. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Max Wellman. Max Wellman. How's this bringing us back to the uh, third segment of the conversation on the Fallon Forum today? I do want to thank the uh, Million Dollar Marathon. And Above and Beyond Cancer for also uh, supporting this program. That's a relay run across the country, 160 marathons back-to-back, a baton being passed from one runner to the next. I think they leave on uh, the 21st of June from the Northwest, from Washington State, coming through Iowa in mid-July, raising awareness about cancer and raising money for cancer research. That's the Million Dollar Marathon. Again, I want to thank... uh, my other business supporters as well, and the other events and organizations that help make this program happen. If you'd like to be one of them, go to my website, click on, well, it's fallonform.com, click on support. You'll see the other businesses, events, and organizations that back this program and and, uh, make it happen. We could use your support. We are the alternative to uh, to right-wing radio, and you'll never hear most of these conversations. Uh, You won't find Tony Bisignano being invited to Jan Michelson's show, except maybe for uh, to be uh, grilled on... Uh, on something that's way out there, way extreme. Um, and you probably won't find Andrew Rasmussen on, on Simon Conway's show too often. So. Sadly not. No. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Sid's Catering and also remind you about the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit coming up on November 9th. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hi, Ed. Great to be back. And you've been uh, probably paying a lot of attention to the uh, closing month or more of the Iowa legislature. With bated breath on the edge of our seats, <laughs> we've been sitting. Yeah. And now school's out and ed reform has passed. And ed reform has nothing to do with me cleaning up my act. I was thinking about yeah. that. Maybe. <laughs> education reform. Yes, education reform. Well, let's quotes. Do, let's, let's, let's think of something doable, okay? <laughs> right. Let's put quotes around that reform because oh, I like who, to call okay. it education deform. It, you really, I, is it, I mean, it really yeah. is what happened that bad. Well, what happened was kind of tepid. Um, a lot of national uh, education reform watchers that took a look at the final results weren't that impressed didn't think it was that big of a deal although you know the governor had to make it a big deal because it was his signature piece um, the biggest 
one thing. Of his, one of his three signature yeah, pieces. Yeah, three yeah. signature pieces. All of which he got in some form or another. Yeah, and I, I would say that the biggest piece of it as far as affecting education, as far as fi- affecting educators that we'll be dealing with in the next five years is the uh, teacher leadership pathways. Um, but the, the biggest success is the we're finally going to get 4%. I can't believe I'm saying finally 4% because really 4% is not even enough. Well, 4%, 4% is allowable about growth. Taking, it's just about uh, staying even when you consider right. inflation, right? Right. And yeah. considering in the past how we were at zero or 2% many years, it's really we're not catching up with what we, we missed mm-hmm. in the past. But that, right. was, that was one of the positives. Um, and then there was, of course, the homeschool um, – uh, rulings that were very interesting, um, and then define the, interesting. Interesting in that most of the education reform that was passed by the state legislature focused on we need to have better teachers. Teachers are the solution to the problem, which is I, I question whether there's an actual problem. But teachers, we need to make better teachers. We need to make them more accountable. Right. And then they turn around and for homeschool parents. They're pulling back on the accountability by by passing laws saying that state uh, school districts don't have to check in with those parents and and test those well, parents well, to make sure that they're teaching a curriculum. Well, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, if we right. if we if we assume that uh, that I mean, I mean, again, this may be one of the issues I, I agree with some folks on the sure. right on the uh, the the you know, parents are presumably going to be the best possible teachers for their kids. I mean, I know there are some parents yeah. out there that, yeah, you have to, you wonder. Right. But presumably, if a parent is willing to commit to teaching their kid at home, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they, they've, they've got a lot invested in their kids. Right. And, I, I, and what I, I find interesting and what uh, many teachers have said is that we're going to all declare ourselves homeschoolers, too, so that we can be freed <laughs> from some of the rules that we have to follow in our classroom that we find onerous and, and kind of taking away from our ability to actually educate kids. And that's kind of the the irony of it is that homeschool parents got a little bit more freedom to right. teach as they see fit. Right. And I'm not going to begrudge anybody for homeschooling. That's fine. If you've got the uh, a wherewithal and ability to do that, go for it. But um, the fact that they have been freed from a lot of regulations by the state and on the other hand, teachers in public schools are being having more – uh, rules and regulations and expectations and accountability placed on them, I think is kind of ironic. So, but is the problem that uh, that homeschool teachers, uh, homeschool parents, have too few restrictions now, or is the problem that we put too many restrictions, too many hoops and hurdles mm-hmm. are now in the way of of public school teachers? Is that the problem? I would say that the latter is is okay. the bigger problem, and I just found it was an interesting contrast right. that the governor was on one hand. Uh, supporting freeing homeschool teachers from all these regulations right. from the state, but then turning around and saying, "Oh, we need to have more accountability for our public schools." Well, and there teachers. were Democratic senators who were dead set against that. Right? Did the teachers union have a position on that element of the reform bill? Um, well, I think when it came down to it, we knew that that was. We found out that was the Republicans. Strangely enough, that was their big piece. They really wanted that, and as you know from legislation, uh, there has to be bargaining chips, and I think. <laughs> when we uh, found out that there was going to be 4%. And uh, one other thing was going to be kind of pushed away into committee land. Uh, I think at one point we decided, okay, well, this is the best we're going to get. Yeah. Um, and the piece I was talking about that got pushed into committee land was one of the more uh, bad pieces of legislation that we avoided, thankfully, that has happened in most other states in this country, and that is the tying of teacher evaluation to student test scores. And uh, instead of the Republicans wanted to push that in this bill, um, and instead the uh, Democrats came back with, well, let's have a committee take a couple years to study teacher evaluation and come back and report. And as you know, as a legislator, that that means just kind of pushing that yeah, to the side. If you want to kill something, you put a committee together. Right, right. So, <laughs> so, so that, to produce that, a report that gets buried in a draw with other... Co- a drawer right. with other other committee reports that have been there for 10, 20 years. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was kind of a, in a way, a success getting that put into a, a uh, committee that doesn't even have to report back uh, requiring that uh, teacher evaluations be tied to student mm-hmm. test scores. And, and that's one thing that, um, that's one of the pieces that is really, all this ed reform is tied to federal mandates too. Um, and and one of the mandates that the Obama administration, the Bush administration, have been requiring for the last 10 years or, or building up to is, is that very thing, tying 
teacher evaluation and pay to the results that students have on mainly their test scores. And uh, we're lucky enough yeah. in Iowa, we're one of the very few, I think one of two or three states that have avoided um, getting so, race to the top sure. grants. And, and the critics are going to argue, well, one reason Iowa is, is, is faring poorly against other states is because it's not doing that. You're going to have that argument. Well, that's, yeah, and the argument gets based on test scores, test score results. And uh, one of the responses I have to that is, why, why are we talking about only test scores? Let's talk about other results that maybe we can't report in a number, but that you can see in front of you. Um, what kind of children are we graduating from our schools? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that is where it gets very dangerous to get into this ed reform debate because you find yourself talking about test scores. And when you find a positive test score, right. you start using it, and then you realize, wait, I can't play yeah. that game because yeah, yeah. I've, I've said that test scores aren't the only way to measure. So I think that is, as I've, I've, as I've done a little more reading into the past of this, this has been building for a while since even Ronald Reagan's time, uh, report A Nation at Risk. We have a totally different paradigm and framework of looking at education s in, since the 80s, which has totally left out one of the key components. And I was actually talking with three students at Central Campus last week at this time. Uh, they have a little group, um, kind of a group of students who are looking into education and education reform. And I noticed, you know, for the last 20 years, what have we, we have only been talking about teachers and test scores. We've not had any discussion about what do students actually need. Yeah. Let, I want to talk more yeah. about that. we got to run to a break. Mm -hmm. I sure. want to talk about that. i got one more homeschooling related question oh, okay. for you right. and then an online learning question. Okay. That, that was in the bill as well. Yep. And folks, if you've got questions, you're welcome to throw them our way as well. 244-0077 is the number to call. 244-0077. You can also email me at fallonforum at gmail.com. Again, I want to thank the Million Dollar Marathon for uh, sponsoring this segment of our show. And I want to thank a few of our other business supporters, the uh, Community CPA and Associates at 3816 Ingersoll, a Ying Sa's firm, now the 10th largest accounting and tax firm in the state. I want to remind you about Fighting Burrito here in Des Moines and in Ames. Join the fight, folks. Get a custom-made burrito for a really good price, $6.50 uh, for a basic burrito that's big and delicious. Also want to remind you about Gateway Market. Our anchor sponsor, in fact, uh, one of our best supporters and also one of the uh, best uh, grocery stores in Des Moines, uh, and one that keeps its money local and also supplies, it gets gets food and and uh, and whatnot from <laughs> food and whatnot. What am I saying? Dairy, <laughs> uh, meat, uh, vegetables, and whatnot from. Is there <laughs> an aisle in their store that says whatnot? It's not. No, it's not. <laughs> there will be after I messed it up. No, they're, uh, they, they've, uh, a lot of their stuff comes from local sources and it's really worth checking out. My favorite is the uh, picket fence line. Anyway, that's Gateway Marketing Cafe at 20th and Woodland. We'll be back in a couple minutes with Andrew Rasmussen with the Des Moines Education Association. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free. What type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> 
You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm gonna take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. That's Mary McAdams, folks, and we're back to our final segment today here on the Fallon Forum. I want to thank the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit for sponsoring this segment. Uh, this is a great opportunity for folks who want to start a business or learn how to accommodate the new, for example, affordable health care changes, new tax law changes as they grow and move their business forward. About 500 people show up for the IES. It's a fifth or sixth annual event. And uh, last year, I believe about 100 new businesses came out of this conference. So check it out, folks, online, IES.org. I also uh, want to remind folks of um, Tinker Heating and Cooling, one of my other business supporters, Leonard Tinker knows how to fix an AC unit or a furnace. He's been doing that for 30 plus years. Give him a shout at 371-2114. I also want to remind you of Hawk Restaurant. That's H-O-Q. Suman Hawk. It's his restaurant. And he knows the importance of local foods. Gets about 90% of his food from local sources. And also a quick reminder about Story County Veterinary Clinic. That's on Highway 30 between Ames and Nevada. Give, uh, give Dr. Kim Holding a shout to help with uh, any pet needs you have. Uh, she gave my pet a shot the other day, and my pet actually looked at her and smiled and said, thank you, Kim. Okay, I made that part up. Anyway, um, Andrew, welcome back to the show. I'm back, Ed. Quick question on homeschooling. Sure. Okay, so um, driver's ed. Uh, mm -hmm. In the past, folks have resisted, driver's ed types have resisted allowing parents, homeschool parents, to teach their kids how right. to drive. Right. Or is your association okay with that change? Uh, I don't know, as long as we're on the sidewalks more, I guess. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I, I recall my mother trying to teach me how to drive a stick and almost getting run over by a semi. So, you know, Are I'm going to blame your mother for that. Yeah, I'm going to go through that lens. I, I right. did much better when I actually <laughs> took driver's ed. Um, yeah, again, it's just another example, I think, of for most people, there's these requirements, including you have to take driver's ed, although now driver's ed has been kind of privatized a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that that issue isn't as, as huge to us uh, other than will the state make sure that the students who are trained by their parents are, you know, able to drive. If they're as long as they can drive on the street and do just as good as the rest of us, I guess that's okay. My mommy taught me, and I've never right? had an accident. Right. That's, he rides other a bike Other than a lot, trying though. to park, Mom. Sorry. <laughs> but you do ride a bike bike a lot. So and, and I, the, only time I've, the only bike accident I've ever had, at least except when I, when I was just learning, uh, was being hit by another bike. <laughs> anyway, so now what about yeah. the online element? There, right. There, that was um, a big controversy last year. Where right, right. That, uh, this, this year's bill uh, only, only uh, appropriates funding for what's called the Iowa Online Learning Initiative, which is actually um, an initiative that provides online learning using Iowa licensed educators to provide uh, certain classes for especially rural schools. So this is different than last year you had um, a couple private groups. Two out-of-state corporations. Right, out-of-state corporations. Not, not just who, groups, but corporations. Right. 
But we're taking Absolutely. the entire. We're only taking nearly the entire. What is it for? How, what's what's the per pupil appropriation roughly? Is it oh, four, isn't it four thousand? Yeah, it's something around four thousand. Yeah, they were taking the entire appropriation. Almost ninety percent of it, I think. I and mean, that, that's that's mm-hmm. hurting the local school district. Right. We're ba- it's basically a way to privatize education, right. as I saw. And and fortunately, that disappeared this year. Um, the yeah. online learning well, that was passed. They, they, yeah, the they, online learning that was passed uh, this year was appropriations for a state-run uh, program that provides uh, online learning from Iowa licensed educators in Iowa. For example, I could teach a class and provide it to a rural school that doesn't have a fabulous civics teacher like me, for example. But <laughs> fabulous it and yeah. modest. Right, right. And uh, modest. But uh, it would. It doesn't involve the uh, corporations, which, uh, you know, if, if you've noticed after a year now, their advertising has kind of gone down and they're kind of... So they're still doing it, but they're yeah. not as aggressive. Right, it's not expanding. It didn't expand, because right. there was talk about expanding it. Right. All and right. that's one of the fortunate things. I have to give kudos to uh, the state-level Democrats. We have a few of them that are actually educators, have been in the classroom. And so I think that really helped in the final outcome of this mm. bill, avoiding some of the uh, more uh, difficult things. Um, but, you know, uh, state-level Democrats have been fairly okay on education policy not so national level Democrats and Democrats in other states, uh, which is one of the problems with the education reform debate is we find enemies and frenemies on both sides (laughs) of of the uh, floor. I'm glad you're a civics teacher, not an English teacher, because you could never get away with that as an English teacher. (laughs) Frenemies? Okay. (laughs) All right, so uh, key elements of the bill that Uh you think are positive. Uh, A couple positive things. I think, you know, finally getting uh, the Republicans to agree to something other than zero or 2% allowable growth is helpful, and they've now set it for uh, 2% for next year plus uh, an additional 2% of one-time money very confusing. They call it two plus two. Um, and then 4% the year after, which means that actually school districts will know how much money they're going to get the next two years, which mm-hmm. is very uh, different. Uh, in the yeah. past, they've not said it when they were required to by law, the state legislature and the governor. And so that's positive. There's also, um, I would say there's a positive um, item Competency-Based Instruction Task Force, which is going to take a look at how we can incorporate competency-based education, which means when you're when you've learned something and you've mastered it, you can move on to the next level rather than waiting in class. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So they're going to take a look at yeah. that. Also, uh, they did uh, create a fund for uh, supplemental assistance for high need schools, schools with high poverty, high ELL. So there's, I think there was about ten million dollars put into that fund, and school districts that have high levels of students in poverty can tap that fund to. Uh, hire more teachers, do more training, and do things to try to help those students. So I think yeah. that was a positive that was also um, slipped in there. Um, as far as the teacher leadership pathways, that all depends on how that's implemented. Um, and that's really the problematic right. part because, again, more hoops, more hurdles for teachers. Right. Um, uh, for example, I could become a teacher leader and try to help other teachers be as fabulous as I am. However, <laughs> in what I've seen in uh, the local district, Uh, And other districts that have tried this in the past, what sometimes happens is those teacher leaders feel like they have become administrators. And instead of being collaborators and helpers, they become uh, administrators. And so we'll see how that's implemented and whether it's going to be continued to be funded because, as you know, uh, things get started and then the funding disappears. Now, you you taught one or both of my kids. I think I taught one of one. your children. Because yeah. I'm going to ask, ask yeah. was it my daughter? Yeah. It's your son. My son, ben. okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to ask him if he thinks you're as fantastic as Uh-oh. you think you are. Well, there's a lot of memory loss in the time <laughs> pass. But, um, memory now, loss. And yeah. then one of the other things that's, that's a not a positive, but that was touted in the register, was that they're going to develop more assessments, more tests. Uh, which are going to yeah. be tied to the Common Core, which is yeah. well, that's, something I'm, I'm that I that. actually yeah. agree with uh, a lot of right-wing Republicans about the Common Core. Not, I don't agree with where they think it's coming from, okay. but I agree that it's not necessarily a good thing, and so that might be a good conversation you, 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 to have. You think there should be more local autonomy? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I would agree with that too. Mm-hmm. So let's have that. Let's have you back sometime, Andrew, yeah. and I'd love to get yeah. some other voices involved with this conversation sure, sure. as well. So, thank you for joining us. I do think it's fascinating that I had a political candidate on the show. Who's wearing a T-shirt, and for that matter, a, a horrible Yankees T-shirt. And here's the teacher wearing right. power red tie with right. black and, coat. And it's and white school's shirt. out. And school's, school's out. out. It's summertime now. So I mean, what were you, 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 you got dressed up just for the show? Well, as you know, as, as a union person, I have to work all year long to make sure that we 
protect our rights. So there you go. All you right. Go. And, and you do do good work, and I, I very much appreciate, uh, I mean, my son is probably a success, more so because of your input than mine, right? No. <laughs> probably his. <laughs> probably his, yeah. Probably his, yeah. Well, he's, uh, he's done amazing things with his work. Uh, uh, he's, he's very interested in this, this um, movie coming out this fall about the, uh, the boarding of the, the um, freighter in Somalia, oh, yeah. off the coast yeah. of Somalia a while back uh, by pirates, because uh, he, he deals with that uh, regularly when he's out to sea. So, All right. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Again, I want to thank, thank you, the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit for sponsoring this segment of our show. I also want to thank Community CPA and Associates, Ritual Cafe, and Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering. And I really want to encourage folks to go to my website, uh, find the businesses that sponsor this program and support them. Make them a part of your daily routine, or in the case of Ritual Cafe, your daily ritual, because it means a lot to them to know that you are following this program, that you understand that their support for it matters and that it's important for you to support them to keep this going. Anyway, um, again, thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us. Uh, thanks to Tony Bizignano as well. I want to thank my producer, Maddie Arrington, and Webcast One Live for providing this studio. Have a great weekend, folks. A lot of pride stuff going on this weekend. A lot of things going on this weekend. Again, this is the cultural and culinary crossroads of the continent, so we would expect nothing less. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno one of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates, in just a minute, there's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too. But actually, it's the beginning of Webcast One Live. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together. And uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.